Welcome to week four of Bible Studies for Life. We're continuing in the Gospel of Luke, heading into Easter. This is the Sunday. This lesson settled for the Sunday before Easter. So today we talk about the crucifixion. It's going to be a great passage out of Luke. I know you're going to enjoy studying and leading teaching if you're a teacher. Before we dive into the passage, if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button. Hit the little bell after that, so make sure you get notifications about the videos when they come up. If you want to, we'd appreciate it if you hit the like button. I mean, it helps a little bit. Hit the like button, okay? Share the video with somebody else and put a comment or a question in there. Let us know where you're watching from. That's been really cool to see over the last few weeks. People from Florida, from Mississippi, from Alabama, from Texas. So we've got the South covered. I know there's some of you from other places. Let us know where you're watching from. Okay, we're going to look at Luke 23 here. And this is a heavy passage and one that, uh, of course, you got to read the whole chapter because there's a lot of stuff we're not talking about today that is important to it. But we're picking up here kind of, you know, as they have come to the, the uh, what we might call Mount Calvary, Golgotha, the place of the skull. Calvary actually is a transliteration of the Latin word for that Calvario. So that's where that comes from. Two others, criminals, were also led away to be executed with him. When they arrived at the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. Okay, this first couple of verses here, this is the summary, right? This is the summary part. There were two other criminals that were taken. Um, it's interesting. There were two others criminals, not two other criminals. Two other criminals sounds like Jesus was a criminal too. There were two others. They were criminals. It's an important distinction there. Led away to be executed. The place called the Skull, Calvary, Golgotha. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. And they divided his clothes and cast lots. No intro to this. No what happened before then? We just know that he has been being, being crucified. He is up on the cross. When he utters this phrase, there's three phrases that Luke will talk about Jesus saying from the cross. There are seven total. You have to take all of the Gospels together to get all seven. They're not all listed in any one Gospel. But we have this one, Father, forgive them. This, this is one of the hardest things to get, isn't it? How does Jesus say this, where he is? How does, how does he utter these words? How did these, these thoughts, this willingness, this grace, he is God in the flesh? I mean, if there was ever a doubt about that or a question about that, that phrase ought to settle that for us, right? That, that he could ask forgiveness for those who are crucifying him unjustly. It's it's an amazing statement, right? And look, we we have to hang on to this because we sin much and we don't know what we're doing. We don't understand the depth of it. We don't understand the pain of it. We don't understand fully what Christ went through because of it to gain us forgiveness. We don't understand. We know what we're, they knew what they were doing. They were experts in crucifixion. They did not understand the impact of what they were doing. They did not see the evil in what they were doing, right? And they divided his clothes and they cast lots. This evil thing, here's what I want you to see in this, okay? Crucifixion is the most heinous way to put someone to death. It is the most horrible method the state has ever come up with to kill someone, to execute someone. Public, on a, on a, 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 a roadway coming into town is where this happened. They're stripped of all their clothes. There's complete, it's not embarrassment, it's humiliation. And there is, a, there is an evil about this. That these men who are doing this, these soldiers who are who are have become the experts in crucifixion, have have killed off a part of their conscience, a part of their soul, that will allow them to do this over and over and over again. So much so that as they're doing it, as it's going on, they can be gambling below and they have no qualms about it at all. It doesn't bother them at all. That's, that's where they are in a spiritual sense to be able to do this, right? And then look what this other part, the people stood watching 
and even the leaders were scoffing. He saved others, let him save himself, if this is God's Messiah, the chosen one. And the soldiers also mocked him. They came offering him sour wine and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. You see the evilness, the the, the making fun, right? The mocking. If he is, we'll let him save himself, right? If you are, save yourself. The soldiers who were hard were echoing what the priests were saying. This is how how depraved the priests were and the people, the people that stand there and the leaders are scoffing. You see, this is an evil act. And on this day, it was the most evil it had ever been or would ever be. This is the day of consummate evil on the world. The, the worst day in the history of the world before or since. This is a horrible day. And you see horrible people acting in a horrible way. And you see people that would not do this otherwise. But when they get in the mob, they suddenly will say things and do things and act ways they never would. But they do hear. It's an evil thing. The inscription was above him. This is the king of the Jews. And then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself. You hear this? Why don't you save yourself? I just want, want to think about that just for a second. Why is it that Jesus didn't save himself? It is because he was too busy saving us. All right. If he would have saved himself, he could not have saved us. He did not save himself because he wanted to save us. He wanted to save those there at the foot of the cross who were yelling the insults at him. That's why he was dying, right? But in the midst of this great evil, this heinous act by humans against another, an innocent person, there is this beautiful, quiet scene of God's mercy. But the other answered, rebuking him. Don't you even fear God since you are undergoing the same punishment? We are punished justly because we're getting back what we deserve for the things we did, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. In this scene of beauty, of grace, of mercy, this quiet scene, it's uh, it's unbelievable, right in the midst of the most evil that could ever happen. The other one, and the, the other criminal that was there. Now, early on, the other criminal is joining in, but something happens. Maybe it's the father forgive them. Maybe it's something else, but he turns in the way that he looks at what's going on. And, and he's like, look, we're getting back what we deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. He's making a statement that is echoed by Paul, 2 Corinthians 5. He says that he made him who knew no sin. Jesus knew no sin. In fact, no government ever uh, called him guilty. They all called him innocent. Pilate declared him innocent. He hasn't done anything wrong. The, the other criminals just recognizing this, right? And then he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I want you to see the simplicity of this statement. Um, he, he wasn't a theological giant. He didn't have great theological understanding. He hadn't been to seminary. He didn't, he didn't have years of church attendance, hearing the gospel preached. He didn't have any of that, right? He's a criminal. He's a, he's a guy who's getting what he deserves as far as the law has to say. And yet he, he makes a statement of childlike faith. Just remember me. It's not the words that we say, pray a prayer. It's not the prayer anybody would tell somebody to pray. It's very simple faith, this very simple faith. It's not as hard sometimes as we try to make it. It's not as difficult as we try to make it for some, and maybe for ourselves even. It is simply, Jesus, remember me. And Jesus says, truly, I tell you today, you know what he's saying? We're both about to die, bud. We're both about to die, but today you will be with me in paradise. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Right? As soon as I leave this body, I go to be with him. I don't know about you, but I'm happy about that. Right? It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three. Because the sun's light failed, the curtain of the sanctuary was split down the middle. And Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit. And saying this, 
he breathed his last. Okay, it's now about noon. It's dark until about 3. This is about 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. is what we might think about. This is six hours of hell on earth. Six hours of evil with this one little bitty piece of, of beauty and graciousness there, right? And and as Jesus dies, as he gives up his spirit, as he commits himself to the Lord, as he makes this statement, I entrust my spirit into your hands, right? The curtain of the sanctuary is split down the middle. That's the curtain that divided from the Holy of Holies is split down the middle, top to bottom. I think it's Matthew that tells us that, right? This separation from God is gone now that Jesus has has made his sacrificial uh, death on a cross. And when the centurion saw what happened, he began to glorify God, saying, this man really was righteous. So we had this picture early on of the people around the cross, and now we have a second picture at the end of people around the cross, and we have a centurion saying, this man really was righteous. He really was the son of God. All the crowds that had gathered for the spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, they went home, striking their chest. They came to see the spectacle. And, and when it was done, they just went home. This is, this is a, um, a statement of grief and maybe repentance for some, but of grief that, that what was, in, in a very wicked way, a festive atmosphere for the priest who thought they were winning over Jesus has become what it is. They see it now for what it is. It was horrible. It was horrific. It was heinous. But all who knew him, those who were there, including the women who'd followed him from Galilee, they stood at a distance watching. They were watching, taking it all in, not knowing. I think, you know, not understanding what we do now as we look back. Everybody that comes to the cross, we talk about discipleship, right? And so I want to, to think about this real quickly with discipleship. Everybody that comes to look at the cross, who looks at the events of the cross, makes a decision about Jesus. That's what we see here, right? Every person that was there made a decision about Jesus. Well, that's still true today. And so as we come to this time of year in the Easter season, as we look at the cross, everybody has to make a decision about Jesus. When you're teaching a class, everybody in your class has to make a decision about Jesus. And don't assume they already have. Don't assume they've already accepted him. Don't make that assumption. All right, give them the opportunity to understand that death is for all of us and that the statement of faith is very simple. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Hey, I hope that's helped. God bless you. Thanks for watching. Thanks for teaching. God bless you, teachers. I'm so thankful for you and for all you do to help the kingdom to, to grow the church. God bless you for that. Be sure and subscribe, like, comment, share it with somebody else. See you next time.